once again, it's a, it's a privilege to be with you as we look together in the scriptures and as we think together about what John has to say to the people who are being challenged from outside and from inside. John was concerned about the congregations that he was serving throughout Asia Minor uh, because of a growing heresy um, in the Greek world called Gnosticism that, first of all, denied the real deity of Jesus Christ, and then also taught a different kind of morality, or immorality as it were. In fact, uh, being Greeks, they had an idea that the soul was separate from the body. That what you did with your body, physically, uh, had nothing to do with the soul, because they believed the soul it's a separate entity that went up into space somewhere. Um, and uh, so once you had your soul taken care of, you could do anything you wanted to do in your body. Uh, some of them also taught that you could reach spiritual perfection by attaining knowledge. If you just had the right kind of information, secret information, that would come through their instruction and you could grasp hold of that, then your soul was saved and you could reach perfection. So John is dealing with this heresy that had come into the church and he is giving them tests that would lead to the assurance of their faith. And we're really always to examine ourselves. You know, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, test yourselves to make sure you're in the faith. Peter, in his second letter, chapter 1, he said that we are to make sure, make our calling and our election sure, be certain that we belong to the children of God. And so John writes his letter, as you'll see in chapter 5 and verse 13 of this letter, that we are to have assurance. He says, I write these things to you, that you might know that you have eternal life. And so John is dealing with this pressure from the outside that's coming into the church, creating division within the church. And obviously there were some problems within the fellowship because John talks about how that these believers, these people who are professing faith in Jesus Christ, are creating problems within the fellowship, disunity. And the people are failing to love one another, expressing forgiveness and acceptance to one another. And so he says the very heart of the Christian life is that you believe the right thing about Jesus, that you have a different lifestyle from the world that shows that you belong to Christ, and then also that you have genuine love and compassion for one another. And so he gives them these tests. And in this passage of scripture today, we're going to look at some very important words from John that have to do with a reality that we all deal with in our life, and that's the reality of sin. And so what John is doing is telling us what to do when we sin in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. We saw last week John's description of us as children of the light. God is light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then Jesus also said in the Sermon on the Mount something very important that connects us with Jesus. He said, you are the light of the world. Because you know me, you're my children, and I dwell in you through the Spirit. You become a light. And we thought about that story from Robert Louis Stevenson about punching holes in the darkness. So we are God's light. We live differently from the world. We look like Christ in our character. And we act like Christ in our conduct. And that expresses and spreads the light of Christ into the spiritual darkness around us. And in that passage last week in the first chapter, we noted that very important verse 9, how that we do sin, but if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, he talks about sinning differently in his letter than he would talk about it in the gospel. In the gospel, he is writing to unbelievers presenting the faith of Jesus Christ. And outside of Jesus Christ, Sin is deadly, and it keeps us from a relationship with God, and we need to confess 
and be born again, as he told Nicodemus. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And so we need the rebirth in God's justification, making us right with himself through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. Now, we have a new nature when we become a Christian. I had a professor in college uh, who said that um, a Christian should sin as much as he wants to. But what he said is, anytime you sin, it's more than you want to. You don't want to sin. So that's why you can sin as much as you want to. If you want to sin, there's something wrong with your heart. There's something wrong with your nature. And so John makes a real difference in the way he talks about sin here in this letter. He's talking to Christians. And he said, even though we've been forgiven for the guilt of our sin and Jesus' blood has cleansed us, we're justified, we're made right with God, we don't continue, we don't keep on in sin in the same pattern of sin that we used to have in our life. You see, there's a difference. We don't want to sin. But we do sin because we're still in these sin-prone bodies of ours. We're still in these bodies that are so vulnerable and weak and in need of the daily grace of Jesus Christ. We have a relationship with Christ, but we will still sin because of this downward pull of the sinful nature. We'll slip up. We'll fail to do what we ought to do. We'll continue to do time and time again things that we shouldn't do. And so we have to confess our sins. And so these are occasional sins in our life that are bound to come. And he says if we don't have this, if we don't acknowledge this sin, we are liars and we're making God out to be a liar. He's saying, listen, face up to reality. We still have that sin nature and we will sin. But God is faithful. He's just. He took care of our sin on the cross. He's brought us into a relationship. And what he wants to maintain for us and with us is fellowship. You'll never lose the relationship with God. You'll always be his child, just like he'll always be your son. Just like these children will always be your physical children. We'll always be the children of God. But we can lose fellowship with him. And we need to confess to him and agree with him. And as Wearsby says, say the same thing as him about our sin. Yes, it is sin, Lord. I'm sorry. I did it. I'm sorry. I failed to do what I should do. I'm sorry that I thought the way I should not have thought. Now, that's a very long introduction. The sermon won't be as long, probably, as the introduction. So, anyway, what to do when you sin? 1 John chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. He says, now, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, it seems like preachers go to one of two extremes. It seems like preachers just love to tell you you're a sinner and preach condemnation. And then on the liberal side, there are those who never mention the word sin, who want you to feel good about yourself. They don't want to upset the way you think of yourself. Don't want to give you a bad conscience. Those extremes. But John is a true pastor because he really cares about his people. And so he says, yes, sin is serious business. <laughs> And I don't like to tell you, but God does condemn sin. I don't want to upset you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. That we are sinners and we need God's forgiveness. But he also encourages, you see. He confronts, but he encourages. And that's exactly what John is doing. We need to know the reality of sin. But he says, my dear children. He has a pastor's heart. He really loves his people. He wants to encourage the hearts of his people. He doesn't want to leave people with a feeling of condemnation or guilt. And so he says, this is what we should realize. We need to realize, first of all, the reality of sin. That word sin is in this little letter 17 times. So he wants us to face the reality of it. Well, actually, that same Greek word for sin is in the New Testament 156 times. So God wants us to know the reality of sin. Now, in my Baptist upbringing, and I've had a Baptist father that I always thought was too strict. I mean, 
what kid doesn't think his parents are too strict? Well, being Baptist and being a Baptist preacher, we were very conservative in our home, and there were certain Baptist sins. The wrong thing about that was, Baptists thought as long as they didn't smoke or drink or cuss, then they were okay and better than everybody else. In other words, there were certain Baptist sins, including dancing, for example. And as long as you stayed away from certain behaviors, you were okay. You were better than other people, especially the Catholics. And so you didn't have to worry, you know? We, we always were comparing ourselves with other people who did all the things that we thought were wrong. And there were just a certain list of activities that we thought were particularly sinful. But sin is bigger than that, it's broader than that, and it has to do more with heart and attitude and relationship. Because you see, as you look in the scriptures in Genesis, it tells us that God created us for a relationship with Him. A relationship that is expressed in love and trust and in obedience. And of course, our spiritual ancestors, Adam and Eve, they were the first to distrust God, fail to believe His Word, fail to live within His will and purpose for our life. And so we reach out for what really doesn't belong to us. And we have an attitude of rebellion against God that says, I can run my life better than God can. Or I can make decisions without any idea of accountability to God. And that's the very nature of sin. It's a spirit of rebellion. It's a spirit of, hey, I can do it my own way, mother, please. I can do it my own way, Heavenly Father. I want to do what pleases me, what makes me feel good. And so that's the spirit of sin. That's the attitude of sinful rebellion. The Bible uses different words. The word meaning missing the mark. Paul talks about how all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is, we've missed the expectation that God has for us, which is to trust Him, live according to His word, live within the center of His will, love Him, and receive His love. The great commandment. Remember when the people came to Jesus and they said, Lord, which is the most important commandment? Well, Jesus said. And, and actually they knew intellectually. They, they were the first to give the answer. And Jesus said, you're exactly right. It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Combining two scriptures. Jesus said, those are the important commandments. If you learn to love God with all your being and love your neighbor as yourself, you're living a perfect life. And of course, the other commandments are given in the scripture that express the life that God intends for us. And it's more than just what you don't do. It's what you do. Jesus made that very clear in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount taught that it's not enough just to not physically kill somebody. That the commandment against murder, taking somebody's life, includes hatred. You can have a murderous heart or you hate someone, or you fail to love someone, or you see someone in need. And Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan to express, this is love. This is what it means to know God. <coughs> Whenever you see anybody in need, you do something. You act caringly, sacrificially. You love God. You love your neighbor. You want to please God. You want to serve your neighbor. You want to treat people with respect and honor. It's the attitude of the heart. It's living within the will of God. It's seeking to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And of course, we never reach up to that, do we? As Tony Campolo says, nobody has ever loved God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength for even 10 minutes. I mean, that means your thoughts are to be directed to God. Your actions are to honor God. Your will is to please God. And so that is what God wants for us. But sin is falling short of that. The Bible also has another word, which is rebellion. Sin can mean rebellion. It means the spirit of, well, you know, what's God done for me lately? I think I'll just have to take control of my own life. I know people who live in real bitterness against God. And it's that spirit of rebellion against God. It can happen with young people as they begin to express rebellion against their parents. And adults as we express rebellion against God and His will and His purpose for our life. And so it's an attitude that covers missing the mark, rebelling against God, doing things our own way, failing to live up to God's expectations. And whatever brings hurt to ourselves, to our character, hurts other people, and hurts God, that's sin. It's whatever fails to minister to others. You know, the Bible says, 
Whoever knows to do right and fails to do it, to him, it is sin. It's failing to do what God wants us to do. It's hurtful. Sin hurts us. It hurts our character. It hurts our conscience. It hurts our testimony. It hurts our reputation. It hurts us even in our health. Sinful things bring bad things to our bodies. Dishonoring the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is our physical body. Sin is destructive in our relationships to other people. Sin is destructive in the most precious human relationship of marriage. Unfaithfulness. These sins that bring destruction in our relationships with our children. Failing to love. Failing to give. Failing to share. Failing to teach. Failing to fulfill our responsibilities to one another. These are sinful, destructive behaviors in our life. And of course, it hurts God who loves us. Who created us for a fellowship with himself. And of course, the most hurtful thing to God caused by sin was the cross. In order to take care of our sin problem, God did something about it. He didn't leave us in our rebellion and lostness. He could have condemned us, destroyed us all. But by His grace and mercy and faithfulness to His covenant with us, He sent His Son to die on the cross for us, who bore our sin in His body on the tree. And so it hurt God. The cost of sin was the cross of Christ. The cost of sin was the cross of Christ. This is reality, what it is and what it does. And it creates within us sometimes a feeling that all is not right. But you know, somehow we as evangelicals have come to the idea, and probably began with the day of John, that okay, as long as we became a Christian, then sin is maybe not as bad as we think it is. Or in the evangelical world, we sort of separate ourselves from our responsibility for sin. We say, okay, God knows we're going to sin. Even John says we're going to sin. So why worry about it? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Have you heard that? I've even seen, uh, seen bumper stickers. It says, Christians are not perfect, just forgiven. Well, you know, there's, there's truth in that. There's truth in that. We don't want to do away with the truth from that. But I'm not so sure that's the, the idea we want to get across. It, it's not that we are just sinners saved by grace. We need to change the way we think about ourselves. That we are being transformed by the Spirit of God. We've been saved by the grace of Christ. We've been cleansed by the blood of Christ. Yes, we are still in these sin-prone bodies, but no longer are we to be known as sinners. We are saints. Now get that in your head. We're not sinners. We're saints. Now, now saint, again, I, I, I'm not demeaning the, the Roman Catholic Church. Some of you may be from a Catholic tradition. There are a lot of good things that we can learn from them. And there are a lot of good things that Catholics have taught me. And so I respect them. But I think there is this idea sometimes that only saints are the ones that have miracles attributed to them. And they've been beatified for a period of time. And then once these miracles can be proven, and then after years go by, then they can be a saint. And only a select few are saints. Well, to me that's a misinterpretation of Scripture, because Paul writes even to the Corinthian church. And the Corinthian church had a lot of sin problems and behavior problems. But Paul says, you are saints. And, and I think what we as Christians need to know is, we need to start thinking like saints and acting like saints and knowing that we are saints because we have been saved by the grace of God. And this is what John is saying. We need to realize the reality of sin and what it does. But we're not just sinners saved by grace. We have a relationship. So what to do when you sin? Secondly, we need to realize our relationship with Christ. Again, we sin. John says it here again. We need to admit that we sin, we fail, we fall short. But then we need to also recognize that God forgives sins. He's faithful, He's just. He's taking care of the sin problem. He will always be our Heavenly Father. We will always be in a relationship with Him, but He wants to have sweet fellowship with us. So, He's our helper. We have a relationship with Christ that we'll never lose. And He is our helper, and when we sin, we have a paraclete. This is what he says in this second verse. 
We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Actually, it's the first verse. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So when we sin, what are we going to do? We go to one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He stands before the Father as the one who died on the cross for our sins. And when we sin, the Father and the Son are there together. And the Son says, I died for her sins. I died for his sins. His sin problem was taken care of. Satan is the accuser. There's a great passage of scripture in the book of Zechariah. We don't read Zechariah a whole lot, do we? But the third chapter has a wonderful story. This was after the exile when they were returning and rebuilding the temple and Joshua was a high priest. And Satan came before Joshua and said, he's a sinner, look his clothes are dirty. He's a dirty sinner. And then the Lord took Joshua and cleansed his garments. And I rebuke you, Satan, the Lord said. I rebuke you, Satan. He is one of mine. His garments are clean. You may look upon him as a dirty sinner, but I look upon him as one who is cleansed because of the great high priest who's taking care of the sin problem, Jesus Christ the righteous. I read in the scriptures even today uh, that the blood of Christ has cleansed us. And without the shedding of blood, there is no washing away, no cleansing of sin. But Jesus' blood and righteousness have covered our sins and have made us right before him. And he's our helper. He stands in our behalf. Satan is our accuser, but Jesus is our helper. And there is no sin, no problem in your life as a child of God that can ever destroy your relationship. And that's why I said to you last week, people who come to me and say, Pastor, have I committed the unpardonable sin? No. <laughs> you wouldn't be asking me if you did. If you did, you wouldn't care. You wouldn't care what God thought or what I thought. Because you wouldn't even be thinking about it. You would be reveling in your sin. Because the unpardonable sin is a condition of the heart. Where you become unpardonable, you won't recognize the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to you anymore. You're so cold and so indifferent. You cannot repent. You cannot turn. That's unpardonable. Until you lose that final opportunity, you will be unpardonable. And eternally separated from God in hell. But if you care, it means you have a relationship and you're concerned about it, and whatever that sin was, regardless of how blatant it was, disgraceful it was, hurtful it was, to so many people, even destroyed your family, I don't know. But He is faithful, and He is just, and He will cleanse you, He will forgive you. And He is able to do that because He is your faithful helper. That's a wonderful word. I'm so glad that Jesus is my helper. That's a wonderful word phrase. You know, you, you can see it throughout the Psalms too. God is my help. He's my refuge. He's my strength. And you have that relationship with one who cares about you. And he solved the problem. This is our relationship with Christ. He's our helper and he solved the problem. Verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's a, a, another Greek word that's, that's difficult to understand. But it's full of rich meaning. It can mean the one who has washed away our sin. It also can mean the one who has stood before the Father in our behalf. He's our advocate. He's our lawyer. He's the one who said, hey, take away the condemnation. The problem's solved. He's free, acquitted, not guilty. And he is the one who stands before the Father to acquit us. You know, we shouldn't think of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in separate entities. Some people think of God the Father as the angry judge. Jesus Christ is the victim who died for us. And he comes before the Father and says, Now lay off of him, Father. Lay off of him. No, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ. So they're together in this. But it's a beautiful picture. It is a wonderful picture about how God in himself is both judge and justifier. Look at that in Romans chapter 3, verse 26. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. And he must deal with sin. He cannot overlook sin. You can't just push it aside. It has to be dealt with because he's just. You see, God can't let an injustice go on in his universe, even in our lives, and even with our sin. So he has to deal with it. So he dealt with it. 
in Jesus Christ and His blood. It's already been dealt with. Now, Jesus is the one who speaks on our behalf. That is, He reminds us that it's been dealt with. God is just, but He's also the justifier. Let me share this story. Okay, I'm going to change the words and the address to make it relevant to you. A young lady in this town of uh, Mayville, she's driving down the street. Uh, she's talking with her friend, just like our daughter used to do when she was in college and had her first car. She gets busy talking and forgets she's driving. And so she's going 90 miles an hour down the 25 mile an hour area of the city. I don't think our daughter ever went that fast, but let's say for the sake of illustration, this girl's speeding so badly, it's a terrible violation. She's stopped by the police, she's taken to the court. She's caught red-handed. Terrible traffic offense. $500 minimum fine, at least. And so she stands before the judge. Here she is, a poor college girl. She doesn't have a penny to her name except what her dad gives her as an allowance. How could she possibly pay this fine? So she stands before the judge. The judge reads the police record. You're guilty. You are guilty. The fine has to be paid. I can't pay a thing, she said. She starts to cry. The judge gets up from the bench and reaches into his wallet, pulls out a checkbook out of his coat pocket, pulls out a checkbook, and he writes a check for $500. You're guilty, but I pay the fine. See? God is just. He cannot overlook the offense. We're caught red-handed. Every time we sin, but the Heavenly Father, by His wonderful grace, His mercy, pulls out the checkbook and He writes the check. See, He's just and He's a justifier. He's the one who stands on our behalf, in our defense, and He takes care of the sin problem. And we need to remember that. And I'll close with this story. Is it time to close? No, we've got all kinds of time. Uh, I want to share the story that I heard from uh, James Bryan Smith, who teaches theology at a small Christian college uh, there in Wichita, Kansas, where we lived for 20 years. But Jim has written some wonderful books about a beautiful and loving God and a beautiful and loving Christian life, a beautiful and loving Christian community that we have. Great series of books. I shared it with our elders, and we went through it as a, as a twice-a-month study before our elders' meeting. But Jim tells a story about a friend named Carrie who came to his office and he said, Jim, I really need some counseling. Now, now Carrie was a fine Christian man. He taught Sunday school in his church. Uh, he was a good example in the church to a lot of young people as well as uh, his own peers. But he had a problem. And he said, Jim, I've got this terrible problem and it's threatening my marriage. He says, it's pornography. And he said, uh, I go on a lot of business trips, and he said, I'll check into a hotel, and the first thing I'll try to do is, is watch a movie, or a program, or whatever it is that you get on uh, hotel television. And he said, I, I'm just doing that. And I've even confessed it to my wife, and, and she said, Jim, I can forgive you because I know that's really not you. I think you have a problem. Uh, Carrie, she said, Carrie, I, I know you have a problem and you need to come to grips with it. So she was very gracious. So Carrie went to Jim. And Jim said, that was a good question that your wife asked you, Carrie. Who are you? It's not you, so who are you? And, and Carrie said, well, I guess I'm, I'm just a sinner, saved by grace, just a sinner. And uh, Jim says, Carrie, you need to change that narrative. You're not just a sinner. Now tell me about your relationship with Christ. And he did, he shared about his experience. So you know that Jesus came and died. Yes, I believe that. So you know that, he, that, that if you die, you'll be with him in eternity. Yes, I believe that. I believe he'll forgive me. Then you're not just a sinner. You're a saint. Change the narrative. Change the way you think about yourself. And if you change the way you think about yourself, it'll change your behavior. You know, I think this is really a, a, what Kerry's dealing with, what he dealt with, is what a lot of us deal with. We just think too little of ourselves. We don't understand our relationship with God and how He has saved us and how He changes us and how He gives us a new nature, how He gives us the Holy Spirit, how He gives us victory and joy. 
You know, Kerry had lost the joy in his life. He was a defeated Christian because he was living in the wrong narrative. And he said, just begin to think of yourself, Kerry, as a saint, as a child of God, that God will help you to live above that level of living and thinking. And you will overcome that by His grace just because of who you are. And so he came back uh, after a few weeks. And he said, Jim, I want to thank you. He said, the last two business trips I've taken, I haven't even wanted to turn on the television, much less ask for a, an adult or pornographic movie. It's different. He's thinking differently, you see. He's thinking as a Christian. He's thinking as a, a saint, as one who's saved by grace, who has the Holy Spirit. And John will get to this later in his letter. He says, he who is in you, who's that? The Holy Spirit. He who is in you is greater than who? He who's in the world, the devil, the tempter, and even your own sinful nature. He's greater. Let him rule you. Let him lead you. Let him love you into a life that honors him and glorifies him. Father, I pray that you would help us to know what to do when we sin, and that is to come to the Savior. And we thank you that you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you, Father, that you've given us victory through Jesus and his death on the cross. That you've made the provision for us to live above the level of sin. That when we do sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us. Help us to envision ourselves, Lord, not as sinners saved by grace and just sinners. But help us to understand that we are saved to be saints. Saved to be holy. Saved to honor you. Saved to have joy. Saved to have peace. Saved to have the presence and the light of Christ to shine in us through us and from us into the world around us. And so, Father, I pray that you would indeed give us grace to live according to your will in a way that would please you and give joy to us and give victory to us for Jesus' sake. Lord, encourage every person in this congregation today, those who might be struggling with this very issue of sin, temptation, daily defeat, and discouragement. And I pray that you would lift them up to a higher level by faith, live a life that honors you. And so I pray this in the strong and blessed name of Jesus and all of God's people who agree, say together, amen. amen. You know, I, I just want to close with this. Uh, I've said enough, but uh, there used to be a gospel song that we'd sing called Higher Ground. Did, did anybody hear that growing up? Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, lead me on higher ground. That's what we need, this higher ground of living. Lord, lift us up and let us stay. Jim, is there anything else uh, you want to share with the people before we go? Thanks, Pastor Roberts. Um, one thing that I have to apologize for um, it's the first Monday of the, or the first Sunday of the month, and normally we have communion on the first um, Sunday, and I completely forgot about it. But as communion is a remembrance of the covenant that Jesus um, made with us, what we do in communion with the elements is just a, a symbol. We can still be in communion with um, Jesus Christ for a single day. So it's it's not about the elements like. I grew up Catholic, so I'm not offended. Okay, <laughs> um, I know the Catholics have a, a, a completely different belief and understanding of the Eucharist than what we do. We we say that they are a representation of a symbol, not the actual presence of Jesus in, in in the elements. So it's not the elements that make the communion; it's the relationship. And so, um, just remember that as as you go through the week. It's the relationship of the saint to the Savior. Um, so have a great week. Be blessed.